This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. We all know the story of the golden calf in the wilderness, but there are two more golden calves that most believers miss. Keith Johnson shares the intriguing story of the tribe of Dan and how you can actually go to the place where this abomination happened. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, there you are. Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Yes, there was more than one golden calf. And no, it was not at Mount Sinai. Do you know where it was? It's an intriguing bit of Bible trivia, courtesy of Keith Johnson, in episode three of his series, Bible Beyond Borders. Tonight, it's the golden calves, plural, 2.0. Now, Last weekend was Yom Teruah. Hope you could join us. If not, the DVD and the Blu-ray will be available soon. Uh, you can pre-order that after Shabbat, of course, uh, using the information on the bottom of your screen. And now, please welcome my co-host, the one and only Tiffany Panaccio. Hey, welcome. Scott. So are you as tired as I am after Yom Teruah last week? Oh, listen. <laughs> I always need a few days to recoup after an event. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was fun. Don't get us wrong. I mean, yes. it was great fun, but you know, it's we work uh, it's, really hard. Yeah, yeah, work really hard. We have lots of fun. Work hard, party hard. Right? That's what oh, we yeah. heard. Heart it's so awakening. Fun. Yeah. So it's good to see everyone. We had a trio of speakers here we don't normally have. We had mm -hmm. Steve Seifkin, uh, Matthew Vandrails, Jake Hilton. Yes. Uh, guys with really good info. Yeah, and Ruach absolutely showed up as he always does, and just. Rock the house. <laughs> yes, it was lots of fun. Was so awesome. again, that, that DVD is coming along very soon. Now tonight we have another special presentation from Michael. Awesome. Uh, this is about the Tabernacle of David and how David created the liturgy for the future uh, for the future temple that his son Solomon would build. And I don't know how many people actually realize that that what they did in the temple because you look in the Torah and go, hmm, well, what mm -hmm. they're doing exactly here? All this all this stuff is not really written down in the Torah, but David created this. That's amazing, yeah. So it's like a little, we get a piece of Michael's wisdom there. Yeah, yeah. To I know explain exactly. where that comes from. That's yeah, it's a great little information. It's, and the video is only five minutes long. It's just a little short video, great snippets. Uh, good to show friends and family if they've never heard this kind of stuff before. Uh, speaking of never heard, hearing stuff before, so Keith, episode three tonight, The Bible Beyond Borders, he's talking about the other golden calves. Yes. Which, you know, until he said something, I was like, you know, I think I've heard about that somewhere mm -hmm. in the Bible, but I never searched it out for myself. Like, yep. I don't know if, you, if you're like this with with, uh, uh, to with Torah portions and this kind of thing. Yeah. If you go to a typical, you know, uh, Torah gathering, yep. sometimes these are the books in the Bible you don't really talk about. You mm -hmm. skip these over a lot of the time, right? Yep. So There was in the northern tribe of Israel, right? They set mm -hmm. up a golden calf because the king didn't want people going down to Jerusalem where they're right. supposed to go. Right, the tribe of Dan. Yeah, we Dan's just, always getting in trouble. Yeah, yeah so. take things into our own hands and think, you know, <laughs> right. because of our insecurities, we go against the Almighty and we can't do that. Exactly right, exactly right. Well, what we have in front of us here is the love gift, but we're gonna let the uh, the commercial do the, t uh, the talking on that tonight. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're gonna get to Michael right away. Okay. okay, so Keith Johnson shares an intriguing story of the tribe of Dan and how you can actually go to the place where the second golden calf incident took place. But first, here is Michael Rood's special presentation of the Tabernacle of David. After a year of residing at the base of Mount Sinai, the Tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant traveled with Israel to 42 camping sites in the Arabian Peninsula, where we chiseled the imprint of our sandal feet into the rocks as our permanent title deed to the land. We were promised every place that the sole of your foot treads is your inheritance, from the Euphrates to the river in Egypt. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, we began our conquest of the land inhabited by the offspring of Noah's accursed grandson, Canaan, the very people who built the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
For the next 400 years, the Ark of the Covenant was lodged in the aging animal skin tabernacle at Shiloh until a man named David from the tribe of Judah was anointed king over Israel. The scriptures tell us that David was a man who diligently sought God's heart, even from his youth. The Almighty promised David that his direct descendant, through the royal lineage of his son Solomon, would be the anointed king, the Mashiach, who would rule the entire world from his throne in Jerusalem. The Apostle Peter, on the day of Pentecost, confirmed that David was a prophet who saw beforehand, by divine revelation, the coming of the Messiah. David recorded some of that revelation in the Psalms and in the ancient scroll establishing the order of the temple sacrifices. David righteously desired to build a more permanent abode for the Ark of the Covenant, but was only allowed to build another temporary tabernacle in the city of David. The scriptures are silent concerning the dimensions and materials employed in the construction of the Tabernacle of David. But we do know, in that tabernacle, David worshiped before the mercy seat, the throne of the future Messianic king, the high priest after the order of Hamelik Tzaddik, the eternal king of righteousness. It was in this time of intimate worship that David prophetically foresaw the coming of the Messiah, and he wrote the liturgy that would be performed in a temple that David would never live to see. David wrote the Psalms, the songs that the people would sing and the Levites would play on instruments in the temple service. David wrote the choreography, the order of service performed by the Kohanim, the 24 courses of the sons of Aaron. And David wrote the instructions concerning temple sacrifices that were offered during the feast. These ordinances and commandments of David defined holy protocol for the kings and priests of Israel and became an integral part of the prophetic shadow pictures embedded in the Feast of the Lord. Upon our return from Babylon, 600 years after the reign of David, Nehemiah gathered and compiled the scrolls that were covertly buried in the earth during our 70-year exile in Babylon. Our punishment for not obeying the land Sabbath for 490 years. Among these hidden scrolls were David's instructions concerning the temple sacrifices. These were the instructions used by the Zedekim priesthood from the time of Solomon until the destruction of Herod's temple, 40 years after Yeshua of Nazareth's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. David was the prophet who put in place the prophetic shadow pictures in the feast liturgy. The prophetic shadow pictures the Messiah must and would ultimately fulfill in every detail. David set aside billions in construction materials for the temple that his son Solomon would build. Yet the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, the throne of the future king, would only find temporary shelter in the tabernacle of David. Hey, my name's Keith Johnson. I am in Israel with the Bible Beyond Borders Tour. I should call it the Bayou Bible Beyond Borders Tour because we have a group from Louisiana and they're making it really fun. But listen, they're on their way to somewhere else. Right to my right, over my right is Lebanon. Over my left is Syria. We're in Israel at a spot that is so significant. It is the place where Rehoboam and Jeroboam split. The Northern and the Southern kingdoms went their own way too golden calves. We are at the spot where one of the golden calves were absolutely left right here. I mean, it's not here right now, but they set it up here. This is an archaeological site that is the spot. So when I open my Bible on the Bible Beyond Borders tour, we open the Bible to the spot where the Bible comes alive. You ought to join us the next time. Check bfainternational.com. Go to the front page and you'll hear what tour we're on. Right now, I just have to continue to go because we got something else we're going to show people, which is like even more amazing. But hey, I don't want to talk about that. Let's go. 
No one seems to know how Yehovah's time clock works, even in the Promised Land. While the Gentile world remains oblivious, and Rabbinical Judaism insists on doing things their own way, one daring duo decided to do it right. I'm here because in just a little while, we're going to attempt to do something that the world is waiting to find out, and that is to actually cite the beginning of the seventh month, one of the most important periods of time in biblical understanding. Keith Johnson and Dr. Nehemia Gordon crisscross the Holy Land to bring you Right on Time from Israel, an adventure that will inspire you to treasure the fall feasts of the Lord like never before. You won't find this exciting teaching anywhere online, but we'll give it to you as our thanks for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 to this ministry in September, we'll send you Right on Time from Israel with Keith Johnson and Dr. Nehemia Gordon on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you Right on Time from Israel, plus a beautiful laser-cut wooden art piece featuring the Second Temple. Donate $300 and we'll send you Right on Time from Israel, the laser-cut wooden art piece, and an authentic natural curve ram's horn shofar plus a matching display stand. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. Your donations ensure that important teachings like Right on Time from Israel keep coming from a Rood Awakening International. Use your cell phone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts or call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. If you like what you see on Shabbat Night Live, you'll love the bonus episodes, now available only on the michaelrood.tv app. These bonus episodes dive deep to give you more serious study, cutting edge content, and righteous raves you won't find anywhere else. It's Michael Rood Uncut. Sign up now to get the michaelrood.tv app free for 14 days. It's everything Michael Rood, plus all new bonus episodes you won't find anywhere else. Sign up to watch now at michaelrood.tv. On Friday, the sixth day of the week, the markets in Jerusalem are filled with challah that is done differently than it is any other day of the week. On that day, the challah is covered with honey and it is covered with raisins because it is a shadow picture of when the Messiah reigns upon the earth in the Sabbath day or the Sabbath millennium when life on earth will be sweet. Yeshua, the last night, that he had with his disciples before his crucifixion, he took bread and he blessed the Most High. And he said, Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech ha'olam, homotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so the sanctification of the Sabbath, the Kiddush that we do, sets apart this day and sets apart this very thing that we had rehearsed from the time that Yeshua gave this to his disciples. And then Yeshua blessed the Most High with this blessing that Melech Zadik said to Abraham when he blessed the Most High. Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Berei Pri HaGafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, the King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, this represents the renewed covenant paid for in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. With that, we do exhibit the Lord's death and what he paid for our redemption until he comes. You know, the Israelites never seem to get it right. In the desert, first thing they do when Moses goes up the mountain, hey, let's make a golden calf, that's a great idea. Well, we know what happened there. But did you know there were more golden calves, like more than one golden calf 
after that. And Keith Johnson, you're here to tell us about that uh, in episode three of our series here. Absolutely, not tell you, I'm gonna bring you. <laughs> you know, I love the fact that we're, we're talking about this, but that's something I wanna talk about real quick, just that I didn't get a chance to address earlier, a couple episodes earlier, um, because I'm having so much fun, um, <laughs> is that this, this issue of the word Palestine, uh, there's a lot of people who have real struggles with that. Well, who are the Palestinians? Where they came from? We, we established that, that, that Rome was the ones that changed it from Judea to Syria, Palestine, Syria, Palestine. And, um, but what, really interesting, when the British came in in 1917 with well, the Balfour Declaration, uh, after they marched into to, uh, to Jerusalem, Allenby marched into Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, and by the time we get to the 1920s, 25, 27 or so, they decide, look, this is uh, this is the you know we're under the mandate of Palestine, so they're accepting that this is the name Palestine. In fact, I'll say something controversial. I know I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but if you lived in this place called Palestine uh, before 1948, and you got a passport that said Palestine. You would say it would say that you are you have a Palestine passport. In other words, if you were Christian, if you were Muslim, if you were Jewish before Israel became the state of Israel, you could have been called a Palestinian. Hmm. Now, here's what's really interesting about this, and I, and I, I got to thank my friend Janet for this. I was I was preparing for this, and I thought I wonder if there are are there, are there any is there any currency that would give us some indication of what was happening at that time. And sure enough, just so happens that I happened to get from my dear friend Janet three coins. I wanna put up the first one, if we can. Let's take a look at the first coin. This is a what's called a one mil, okay? This is a one mil coin. It take a thousand of these to make one British pound. <laughs> okay? Oh, okay. But I want you to notice something. What they decided, the British they decided that there would be three official languages. Hmm. Arabic, English, and Hebrew. Now, we went to uh, the jib master, and I said, jib master, can you take some pictures? Now, Brian, he's, he's like the guy, that, he, he, he did this so fast, he did it so you could see it. You gotta see this. So I asked him to take both sides of the coin. So on one side, they have, they said there can be no religious, um, Nothing religious on the coin. It's very important it's not religious because you got the Arabs, you got the English, and you got the, 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 the Jews. Nothing religious. So they put an olive uh, branch there. The olives is kind of an agriculture thing. Everybody loves olives, right? <laughs> but I think this is so amazing. So I get this 1927 one mil, the first year that this was done. And if you notice, Scott, something really interesting, Arabic, English, and then you see in Hebrew, Philistina, and then you see parentheses. Do you see the parentheses? Yeah. There's two Hebrew letters there. Do you see what those two Hebrew letters are? Aleph and a Yod. Oh, you always tell me you don't know anything about Hebrew. You, it's, it's Aleph and a Yod. You know what that represents? No. Eretz Yisrael. Uh. And when, <laughs> this is amazing to me. <laughs> so it means Eretz Yisrael. In fact, let's go to the second coin, just in okay. case you, do. the second coin. Here is a coin, it's about 83% silver. This is what's called 50 mils. You notice to the right, you've got 50 mils, and it says that 50 mils in Arabic, it says 50 mils in English, and it says uh, Hamishim mil, which is 50 mils in Hebrew. By the way, I gotta just tell you something. The one thing I have loved uh, in my last 20 years is learning a little bit of Hebrew and now learning a little bit of Arabic. It, it is. It is, it, is, it is so, like, it opens my, my heart and my mind and my spirit when you start dealing with languages. It really does. It's an amazing experience. So when I read the back of the coin, what does it say? from 1935. Palestine, Philistine, and then it says Philistina, and do you see the Aleph and the Yud? There it that is means? Land of Israel. Eretz. Eretz. Yisrael. What? <laughs> Can I see the third coin? This shows me that there is a hole in the strategy of the political power <laughs> brokers, okay? They put a little hole in this coin, okay? This is something they would do in ancient Rome. They would put holes in the coin and they would use them and put them around. But, but this coin actually, 1927, this is five mils, milim. It says that in, in Arabic and it says it in English. And if you see Palestine, you see the Arabic word for Palestine, and again, you say Philistina, and this is the best. Thank 
you uh, on this one. This, this is just this is just great. Look at look at the picture. Aleph Yud. Eretz. Remember Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim va et Haaretz. The land or the earth. Eretz Yisrael. When they saw this coin. Now, I got to give it to my, my Jewish brothers and sisters. Whoever designed this coin, like, this is like really like, <laughs> it can't be anything religious. You know, can no, yeah. nothing religious. Oh, but guess what? When we go to what the meaning, I, we should talk about this. We should talk about this. Can we, can we do something? Can we just talk about for a second the meaning of where the word Yisrael came from? Look at what it says. Eretz Yisrael. Do you know who it was? It was um, Jacob. Right? Who had his name changed to Yisrael, which means you will contend, you will strive with God and with man, and you will prevail. Come on. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that what's happening? This is 1927. Two years later, the Hebron massacre. In 1936, mm. the Arab revolt. In 1948, Israel becomes a nation, and five Arab armies come to fight Yisrael, and what happened, Scott? They strove with God, and they strove with man, and they were able to be successful. And this is the God that we're dealing with. He is the God who is so amazing that he like, like, I mean, I, to me, like, when I look at these coins, I'm like, man, do they realize what they, they did? In 1927, they're saying, Eretz, Yisrael? Now, I got I, I don't know if I should, I don't know if we have time for this. I got to show you something. I didn't put this up. We'll have to put this up as a picture. This is from the President Harry Truman in 1948. When Israel decided to be a nation, they, they declared their, their, in other words, the United Nations finally says, okay, look, we're going to have this Palestinian-Israeli problem. We're going to fix it. It's gonna, we're going fi to fix the Palestinian problem. We're going to have a two-state solution. How's that working out, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> They're still trying. They're still trying. But in 1947, they said, okay, there will be a Jewish nation. The, Arab, the Jews said, okay. The Arabs said, no way. We don't want it. We're not giving up one inch. Here's what happens in 1948. Harry Truman sends this, I think it was, I think at uh, 6, 11 p.m. after, after uh, Ben-Gurion established the fact that this is the state of Israel. It says this. We'll put this up as a picture. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the, and what would originally said is of the new Jewish state. Harry Truman said, haven't they picked a name yet? Hmm. Is that the name, the new Jewish state? He said, what's the name? He said, it is called the state of Israel. He crossed out Jewish state and put state of Israel. This is the United States of America in 1948. Mm. I mean, you, 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 when you're in the land of Israel, you're, you're experiencing, you know, God's hand on Jacob and God's hand on the president of the United States to write state of Israel. Now, they had determined that that's what it was going to be. But there was debate, what should, we, what should it be called? There was a few different options that they came up. I think it's prophetic that they named it the State of Israel. Like I said, when they offered in 1937, the Peel Commission, they offered 25% of the land to the Jews, 75% to the Arabs. The Jews said in 1937 with Peel Commission, okay. The Arabs said, no way. 1948, they upped the number. Okay, we're gonna offer 55% or whatever the number. And the Jewish people said, okay, and the Arabs said, no way. And so get to these battles about the Palestinians and, and Palestinian rights. Listen, from the very beginning, it was supposed to be a two-state solution. At least the political power brokers thought so. But there's a hole in their theory. You don't own the land. Mm. <laughs> Who owns the land, Scott? God. And does he, what does he do? Sometimes he... He gathers and, and he, sometimes he, he scatters. And guess what he decided to do in 1948, once they became the state of Israel? He began to gather and gather and gather and gather and gather and gather. And all of this is just an amazing picture of his hand, mm. of his people. And what an amazing opportunity we have. Now I go, again, some people financially can't do it. 
Some people because a family can't do it. Some people physically can't do it. But for those that can, why wouldn't you want to go? In fact, you know, Scott, this is the month like, you know, like this is the month where I'm inviting you like to be in Israel. Hopefully, you know, <laughs> it worked itself out. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, that I just wanted to share that before we get to um, get this. I just want to share this verse, Genesis 32, 28. He said, your, your name shall no longer be Jacob or Jacob, but Yisrael, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. I think this is uh, really, really interesting. I'm going to show, uh, in, in post, I'm going to show the, um, the Hebrew verse, and I'm going to highlight uh, the letters and what you see in that Hebrew verse, ki im Yisrael, ki Yisraelita, im Elohim, you see a yud for Yisrael, you see a, a sheen and a resh, and you see an aleph and a lamed, which spells Yisrael in that verse. Mm. <laughs> in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that Yehovah had commanded them to be given. So that's, mm. I mean, I think that's pretty darn amazing. That is beautiful. Wow. So we're going we're gonna to shift gears and talk a little bit about Dan and Bethel if we have time. Yeah, absolutely we do. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to open your Bible, if you can. I'm going to actually read this real quick. This is Judges chapter 20, verse 1. Then all the sons of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. The reason I'm reading this, I'm also going to give you these verses. 2 Samuel 3.10, 2 Samuel 17.11, 2 Samuel 24.2. Uh, 2 Samuel 24, 15, 1 Kings 4, 25, 1 Chronicles 21, 2. All of these talk about uh, establishing the most northern part of Israel, starting at Dan. And what do we know about Dan? Is Dan is too far to the north, which is by Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is just to the very tip. They call it the eyes of Israel. If you're up at the top of Mount Hermon, by the way, um, our fall tour, we go to Mount Hermon, we take the ski lift up to the top and take it as a time to pray. You see Lebanon, you see Syria, you see all of Israel. It's like, it's absolutely amazing. That's Judges 20, verse 1. Uh, Judges 1, verse 34. It says, Then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the valley. And this is a story that's talking about the tribe of Dan that's being moved far to the north from what was originally given. In fact, let's just take a look. Let's go to the border, if we can, to the map. I'm gonna show you this right here. And what you see here is you see um, Betel right there. And then to the north, the very north is where you see ancient Dan. Now here's what's so cool about this is that at, there's actually a spot uh, at this very place where we actually go. I, I mean, think of this, Scott. This is so cool. So there's a place called Ancient Dan. We take our tour group there. The bus goes all the way up there to the base of Mount Hermon, and we get out, and you're walking, like at the headwaters of the Jordan River. It's like just amazing, and it's beautiful, and you see all of this greenery, and it looks really, really, really wonderful. And then all of a sudden, you come into this area where the game has changed, and you see a recreation of the altar of the golden calf. Oh, man. I want you to read Judges chapter 17, if you can. Or should I read it and then you read the next one? How about sure. that? Yeah. Judges chapter 17, verse 3. He then returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I wholly dedicate the silver from my hand to Yehovah. If you look in Hebrew, you see Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, no question. She says, I'm going to dedicate this silver from my hand to Yehovah for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Wait a minute, what is going on here? <laughs> now, therefore, I will return them to you. So when he returned the silver to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave them to the silversmith who made them into a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. So... This is actually happening in this area of Dan, where this woman is saying, I'm going to dedicate this to Yehovah, and she brings it to the silversmith. And they make for her a graven image and a molten image. 
And this is the first time that we get an indication of this thing that's happening at this place of Dan. I would say, uh (laughs) uh-oh. Judges 18.2. So the sons of Dan sent from their family five men out of their whole number, valiant men from Zorah and Eshtahol, to spy out the land and to search it. In other words, they're being sent to the north. They can't get the area that they thought they were going to get. So they're to the north, and they said to them, go search the land. And they came to the hill country Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and they lodged there. Now we have, from the tribe of Dan, in the house of the man who has the golden, the molten image, (laughs) and the graven image. So we're thinking something's going on. I want you to read Deuteronomy. Which one did I give you, real quick? Uh, We had... Earmarked here, 1 Kings 12. Okay, before you do that, let me read Deuteronomy 27, 15. A little excitement on my part. Deuteronomy 27, 15. Here's what it clearly says. This is back to the first episode on the mountain of curse, the mountain of blessing. Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molten image. It is an abomination to Yehovah, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. That's why when we read the curses, I, last week I said go to Deuteronomy and read the curses. You read the curse and the people are supposed to say amen. In fact, would it be, would it be too controversial to read those? Do we have a, a few minutes? Just, oh, let's do it. Just to read those real quick. This is Deuteronomy 27, verse 14. The Levites shall then answer and say to all the men of Israel with a loud voice. Now, you got to remember this. They're at a place where you've got Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval. If you're there, we saw with Aaron, you know, in Gerizim, it is like an amphitheater. You could be like hundreds of thousands of people are over here saying amen. And hundreds of thousands of people are over here saying amen. Here's what it says, nice and loud. And if it would be okay, would you represent all of Israel? Would you represent the people and those at home? When I read it, read the curse, you say? Amen. Okay, here we go. Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molten image, an abomination to Yehovah, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret, and all the people shall answer and say? Amen. Cursed is he who dishonors his father or mother, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary mark, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who misleads a blind person on the road, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who distorts the justice due an alien, orphan, and widow, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's skirt, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who lies with any animal, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, of his mother, and all the people shall say? Amen. Cursed is he who li- boy, this is a little controversial, isn't it? Is that a little, yeah. Cursed is he who lies with his uh, mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who strikes his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who accepts a bribe to strike down innocent persons, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this Torah by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen, and amen. So. By the time we get Mm. to Dan in the north and Betel a little bit down further, something happens, Scott, that is absolutely mind-boggling to me. The people actually go exact opposite of what he just said and make, in fact, it's not the people, it's the new king of Israel that does it, and we're gonna take people to Dan, and we're gonna take people to Bethel in the the second half. All right, well, hang tight for that. You hang tight for that, too. Come back and see us in the second half of this episode. Thank you for making this possible. Your donations make this show possible, so thank you. It will also allow others to see this into the future. Your donations now can help do that. Thank you in advance.
hey, thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. I don't know if you go to a Sabbath gathering like I do, but a lot of Sabbath gatherings choose to read a portion of the Torah, and it's, it's a traditional thing, and then you move on and you do some of the New Testament, and then there's some, some of the writings in the middle. But somehow we've missed this one part. You know, we always read in the Torah about the golden calf incident. Well, I didn't even realize until Keith Johnson brought this out to me that in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, we read, so the king thought this over, so he had a chance, <laughs> and then made two golden calves. He said to the people, you have been going up to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, Israel. That sounds just like Aaron. Uh, These brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He set one up in Bethel, and the people went in procession all the way to Dan in front of the other. He set up the temple of the high places and appointed priests from the ordinary families who were not of the sons of Levi. What is he doing? Yeah. Doesn't it sound like that? Doesn't that sound so radical? It sounds crazy. Like, why would you just separate from the root? It sounds a little bit like what I see happening all over the world today. <laughs> right? A little bit of a deliberate... It sounds uh, a, bit a little of... bit of a, like a deliberate disconnection from mm -hmm. the God of Scripture. It sounds a little bit like a Jeroboam. That was Jeroboam, actually, the first king of the northern kingdom after the kingdom split, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Jeroboam said, now wait, now how am I going to run this? How am I going to lead this? Man, I'm, I should probably make the, the holy place Rome. I, I mean, sorry, I should probably make the holy place. <laughs> I should change the holy place. You know, yeah. I should maybe, maybe I should have a new, they should have a new uh, place of focus. So what does he do? He goes and he says, I tell you what I'm gonna do. Historically, they were already doing things up in Dan. Let's make one of the places Dan. And here's the thing that's so amazing about going here. When I take people here, I mean, it. like I said, you, you get off the bus and you're walking and you see these clear waters and you're walking these trails and the people are enjoying it and they're, they're breathing in and they're looking at the trees and they're looking at everything. And then all of a sudden you come across this area where I stop right there. I open my Bible and I read what you just read. And then right behind me, you actually have the recreation of the foundations of this actual altar. Mm. that right there, Jeroboam said, I will place here, and they've actually found archaeologically, archaeological things, that, you know, different th artifacts from way, 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 way back. But what you have right there is an attempt to remove people from their root mm. and create a new religion. That is basically what Jeroboam is doing. He's creating a new religion. And so what does he do? He puts up the altar. Mm. And then he says in the altar... Here's the golden calf. Now, what does the Bible tell us? It tells, it tells the people of Israel, go to Jerusalem, to the place that I placed my name, for the men 30 years, three times a year, and he's saying, look, ah, forget about that. I got a much more convenient situation for you. If you live close to Bethel, just go to Bethel. If you live close to Dan, just go to Dan. It's so much more convenient. It's like, it's like setting up New York and Las Vegas. Oh, you don't need to go to the real <laughs> Statue of Liberty. We got one over here. <laughs> oh, that's good. So in Las Vegas, they said, like, here's the pyramid. What do you need to go to Egypt for? We got the yeah. pyramid. We got the statue. Well, Las Vegas is kind of like Dan. Anyway. Yeah, right. No, but that, it's, it really is interesting. And then the other one he set up in Bethel. Now, I want to um, I I read, if I can, Bethel. And I mean, Scott, you guys, and by the way, A Root Awakening production team, everybody has been so amazing. I got to thank Keith Kelt. I'm going to say his name. Why? Because this guy took all of this footage and organized it for me and literally put it to a place where I could understand it. Then I could hand it to Jacob for the Rude Awakening YouTube and to Stephanie for the, 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 the app. But it's like you should see the amount of, it's like two, I think he told me it's like two terabytes. Well, that's why he emailed you at one in, one in the morning or something? Like, yeah, I mean, he's been worried. <laughs> like he, has, he gets in this mode where he's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he sends it to me. So anyway, I just have to thank you guys. Scott, thank you. Um, you even had struggles getting here. Uh, there's been a lot of challenges. I've had some challenges, but I think it's worth it to get here for this. Genesis chapter 35, verse 3. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So, so they gave to Jacob. Now, this is Jacob speaking. Way back in Genesis chapter 35, verse 3, what does he do? He goes to Bethel, and he builds an altar there to God. It's called... House, Beit El, house of God. 
So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had in the rings, which they were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. They were back to Shechem. Now, I want to show you again. Here's the, here's the place to the border. We've got Bethel right smack in the middle of Judea and Samaria. It's really interesting. When uh, Aaron um, took us on the, the we, were, we were Mount Gerizim and, 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 uh, and Mount Eval, he took us to Ophrah. He took us to his quote unquote settlement that's illegal according to the, uh, the, to the power brokers of the world that it's illegal for uh, Jewish people to go to the place of Judea and Samaria and to, 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 to live in that place. But he did a phenomenal job. He took us there and he went around and he's, he's sharing with our group and he's pointing to places and he's pointing to places and like we're sitting there and he's saying, and over there, you see by this Arab village that is called X, this is actually, and over there is Bethel and oh, and it's like just absolutely amazing. Like it's right in the middle of Judea and Samaria. And yet it's a place where he can't live. He can't be there. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next episode. But let me just, let me just say that um, to be in those places and to see those places that are rooted in that makes a lot of sense. Now, Jeroboam is a smart man. He's saying this. Uh, listen, now, they're already got the golden image thing going up in Dan, but we got the altar of God in Beit El. Jacob, I went back to the time of Beit Jacob. So why don't we take one of these uh, golden calves and let's just cover over this place with another religion, literally. So let's do something if we can. I want us to go to uh, clip number four. And can we watch this? This is, this is in Beit El, uh, just a short teaching that we did from the actual spot. This is an example of being at a place that is the picture of the Bible beyond borders. We're actually in a place called Bethel or Bethel in English. And what I wanna do is I just wanna open my Bible and give you an example. And we're actually standing at a spot where I'm gonna read my Bible and we're gonna talk about being at that very spot based on this passage. It says, then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran and he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am Yehovah, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed and behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And I read that and I'm thinking, being back in Israel after all the things that have happened over the last few years, I was just sharing with Kari, he's like, I feel like I've been brought back here for a reason. And I'm reading this verse at the very place it happened. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely Yehovah is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And when he says in English, the house of God in, in Hebrew, that word is Beit El, Bethel. So we're actually here at the very spot. By tradition, both Christians, Muslims, and Jews consider what's behind me as the place where Jacob had his moment, where he knew there was something special about this place and we're actually here. You are here with us at Bethel, the house of God. So, I mean, to me, I'm thinking to myself, now wait a minute, uh, some of these places that we go, these are places where they're not just that our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but where they actually had, you know, revelation, vision, presence, you know, where God is doing something in the land. Bethel is in a great example where that's happening. The thing that's so crazy about that, though, is that, so here you have the situation where Jacob goes there. Jacob gets his name changed there to Israel. There are so many things that happen there, and yet Jeroboam comes along and says, oh, forget all of that. Now, again, I actually um, have made a pretty big decision in my own personal life, um, which is to disconnect myself from the denomination that, uh, that I used to be a part of. I used to be a full-blown 
100% United Methodist elder in the Methodist church. And, uh, and there's people who say, well, why would you ever be a part of that? That's where God first caught me. You know, when I first became a Christian, it was in a Methodist church. I mean, I learned about, you know, the Bible in a church. Um, yet, the more I have learned uh, in Scripture, uh, the more that I see that, uh, that many times what Western Christianity has done is some like what Jeroboam has done. Mm. Well, you don't have to worry about the God of Israel. We got another. Hey, you don't got to worry about those feasts. We got some other feasts for you. Hey, you don't got to worry about this. And then the ultimate thing for me, Scott, was um, what happened just recently where the United Methodist Church was one of the last mainline denominations, mainline denominations, uh, to go with culture uh, regarding this whole issue of, the, uh, of sexuality. It's a real complicated thing. I know I can't talk too much about it. But uh, I, said, I sent a letter to the bishop and I said, listen, you know, I've been waiting for the opportunity for when I knew for sure that enough was enough. And uh, I made that decision and I wrote the letter to the bishop and I said, you know, bishop, um, thanks for whatever, but I'm out. He sends a letter back. It wouldn't be probably financially wise for you to do this at this time. You know, we're going to be having the general conference here in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is 2020. 2019, God says, get out. I get out. I send my letter. I'm done. Send my papers. It's done. It's over. I don't want to talk about it. I said, I don't want, you know, it's interesting. You didn't ask me one question about why, but you're talking to me about something that I have no concern about. I'm done. 2020 comes, the general conference where the world's going to come and vote on whether the church is going to split or not. 2020 comes, guess what? Canceled. So if I don't get out in 2019, I'm still there right now because they still haven't had the world conference. Why? Oh, really? COVID. Oh my and God. guess what? This is amazing. So they tried Minneapolis in 2020. They try in 2021. They try in 22. They find out we're finally going to do the world conference. Where are they going to do it? Charlotte, North Carolina in 2024. Oh, my God. Somebody say, but I'm no longer a Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Because it's the spirit of Jeroboam. Well, it's the spirit of Jeroboam. Really I'm telling you. It's like, let's change all of this. Let's make our own religion our own way. Forget about what the Word of God says. Let's do it according to ourselves. And it, that's really this issue. It really is that simple. Is People say, well, it's a complicated issue. No, it's not. It's not. God says in several places yeah, here, this is, that issue, that's wrong. Yeah. So that's yeah. just like making a golden calf. Yeah, it's yeah. the same thing. And, and, I, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm quite discouraged these days as, uh, as I look at uh, society. I mean, I think that we're at a place where uh, the scattering, if, if there is such a thing, uh, like Babel, where he scatters, I mean, I think we're at a place where the scattering is 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 taking place or soon to take place uh, just because uh, what's happening right now is so contrary. And that, that's what I love about us going to Mount Eval. We're, we went to Mount Eval where the curses, in fact, if you read, you'll find that there's a whole lot more information about the consequences of the curses than the blessing. Believe mm -hmm. it or not, I know yeah. that's a controversial thing, but just read in Deuteronomy, chapter, two, two, two chapters just on that. So that's that. I mean, and so we've got, um, the other thing I want to tell you is that in Betel, there are traditional spots that are there. One of them is, is, is what they believe, Aaron was talking to us about this, is, is actually the actual stone place where they think that Jacob was. I mean, whether it was mm -hmm. or wasn't, maybe it wasn't that exact place, but we're in the area where this took place. Betel, both as a settlement and Betel as a place, it is right there. Now, there's another short little video I want to show real quick. Just 30 seconds, because I want to talk about this. This is about the actual place where, so what we have is, so you got Betel, Jacob. You have him having his, you know, the ladder going up and down, all of that that took place. It's an amazing thing in Genesis. You have Jeroboam later that says, you know what, I think uh, we'll make Betel the spot where we're going to put up the golden calf. Why? Because he knows that people consider that place a holy place. They, he knows exactly what he's doing. But here's what's cool, Scott. You can go there and see the actual foundations of where he had the golden calf. And I mm. actually have a 30-second video, clip number five, where I'm actually on the actual place where that happened. We are actually here in a place that we talked about at Ancient Dan. It says in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28, that Jeroboam brought two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan. <laughs> Guess what? We're at the actual spot where the verse matches the place. The Bible Beyond Borders is right here with us in Bethel. Mm. So right behind me, right under my feet. Like, I mean, so, so again, let's just back up for a second. We, we go 
to Dan. We take the group there. In fact, I didn't get the chance to even talk about this other than the place where the altar is. We actually go down and they have the gate where the, where the, where the leaders would sit at the gate of the city. Walls that go all the way back. There's, there's there what they call the gate of Abraham. Amazing, hmm. amazing. Not because it's actually Abraham's gate, but because it's at the time that Abraham would have been there. How do we know that? The Bible says that when Lot was taken, Abraham went all the way to Dan and then all the way to, Ma to Damascus, literally. He went all the way to Dan. So that gate existed at the time of Abraham. And I'm sitting there in front of the gate and I'm like, man, and they uncovered this and it's beautiful. It's amazing. It's old. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, it's possible Abraham walked through this gate. You know, I mean, Hebron, I'm crazy. <laughs> You gotta come to Israel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, it is just absolutely amazing. I wanna read 2 Kings, if I can, uh, chapter 17, verse five. It says this, then the king of Assyria invaded the whole land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried away Israel away into uh, exile. They forsook all the commandments of Yehovah, their God, and made for themselves molten images, two calves, mm. and made an Asherah, and worshiped all the host of heaven, and served Baal. If you ever had a question about why the landlord kicks out the tenants, why they might be scattered, doesn't it trouble your heart to hear, imagine you're Yehovah, you called this people out of Egypt. They are a segula, a, a, a special possession. You help them to deal with the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites. You give them the land as an inheritance. You say to them, enjoy. And then they do something like that. And I mean, can you imagine, I don't know if you've ever been a, a you know, been an owner of other property where people have rented? Have you ever had that? I have, yep. Oh, you have? Yep. Have you ever had, tell me the experience. So uh, we bought a property next to us in mm -hmm. Canada. And we, were, we thought that was convenient so that the, uh, you know, the tenants would behave themselves because the landlord's next door. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that was great. Uh, but you know, there's, there's things that come up and you're kind of disappointed that, uh, you know, and, and do, do you have to, you know, yeah. make these people go into exile? <laughs> I never, I never <laughs> yes. got to that point. Yeah, yeah. But at a certain point, we decided we'd had enough of this mm -hmm. and we sold it and we didn't want nothing else. We, yeah. we want yeah. nothing else to do with it. You know, and it's interesting because what's amazing about Yehovah is that he, he could do the same thing. He'd say, you know what, I tell you what, I tell you what, this, this Palestinian problem, the Israel problem, the battle between, the, you know what? He could have been like the British. You know what the British did? So when the British came in and they gave them the mandate after World War I, you know, they'd done, and I don't mind telling you this, they did some double dealing. They did some double dealing. They did some dealing with the Arabs. They did some dealing with the French. They did some dealing with the, 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 people, the, the, the Jewish people. They did some dealing with a bunch of different people. And then when it was all time for it to get put together, they said, you know what? <laughs> this is way too complicated. So what they did in 1948, before Israel became a nation, is what the Brits did is, look, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what Israel said? Just as well. We'll take the part that you've given us. And they said, that, but isn't it interesting? Yehovah could say the same. You know what? Too much hassle. You're in the news too much. You're causing too many parties, too much confusion, yeah. too much frustration. You're embarrassing me to you're, have my name on your, yeah. I'm out of here. But he loves his people and he loves his land. He doesn't give up. And guess what the good news is? We're in the process of gathering right now. And I'm telling you, to go there, Scott, I, I'm gonna keep saying to people, I got two agendas. Some of you will never go to Israel. I want you to enjoy this. You'll never get on an airplane, physically, financially, family, but there's some of you that can, and I want you to come with us. 2024, we're gonna do the Bible Beyond Borders again, mm. if God says the same. But I'll tell you something, Scott, it is an amazing experience to be at these places, open the Bible, and it all comes alive. Beautiful, I love it. Well. We're gonna talk more about this next week. Wait till the next one. Next, we're gonna talk about Jericho and Bethlehem. Oh my god! Next gosh. week. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. I can't. Oh wait. boy. <laughs> and I love. You sure you want to do that yeah. one? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we already, we're in deep, deep, deep this far, so why not? <laughs> yeah, right? here we go. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. We're going to go deeper next week with Keith Johnson to Jericho and Bethlehem in episode four of this beautiful series. I hope you're enjoying it as I am. And if you never get to Israel, guess what? You're going to go next week with us. So see you there. We'll see you next week for another episode on Shabbat Night Live. Thank you for joining us. Until then, Shabbat. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.